Back on day one of the conference, we talked with industry leaders about their significant response to COVID-19. I would like to thank everyone working in rail for their contribution this year, especially the many frontline workers that kept things moving for us. But as we all know, there is a great deal of work still to do. While we have taken step to steps towards a new normal this year, it will be some time yet before our trains are back to capacity and our freight services return to more regular patterns. So how do we make the most of the lessons of this year? What are the opportunities for the rail industry as we emerge from the pandemic? And what are the things we must do differently after COVID-19? To help us discuss those issues, I am joined by my fe fellow panellists. Firstly, welcome to Oricon Managing Director Transportation ANZ, Becky Wood, who joins me here in the studio. On the screen, I'd like to welcome Amy Lazala, who is the Level Crossing Engineering Manager at Metro Trains Melbourne, Mike Murdoch AO, the Chair of NEC Australia, John Fullerton, the Chair of the National Freight and Supply Chain Strategy Freight Industry Reference Panel. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello, it's lovely to see Hello, you. Hello, Caroline. Um, so no pressure, but we're bringing it home after three three days of intense discussion. <laughs> um, so, you know, for everyone playing at home, we're going to keep it as peppy as we can to make sure we uh, engage you in these final comments. Um, in terms of um, where we are now, what I might do just to make it easy is uh, to throw to each of you just to get your thoughts on where to from here. Uh, and then we'll start with some of my hard-hitting questions. So, um, Becky, since you are here, let's open with you. I'm happy 20, to start. 2021, <laughs> what do you think? Where to from here for all of us? I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in really looking forward to the fact it will be 2021 <laughs> rather than 2020. I, mean, I really like the way that um, Andy Byford just closed out some of his thinking on collaboration, actually. Mm. One of the things I have thought was really, really valuable was in particular seeing the ability to use these digital platforms that we're now perhaps overly familiar with to really engage with uh, colleagues, peers, customers across the whole of the globe, actually, beyond even just Australia's shores and New Zealand, and learn from them in live, in live environments. So, you know, lessons learned is a great principle. It's a good thing to collaborate in principle, but actually doing that in real time, I think, has been a really powerful opportunity for us. And I'm really hopeful that we will take both the opportunity to keep engaging in live time and to understand from each other what we're doing, um, but also the principle that sharing lessons about things that haven't gone quite so well, as well as things that have gone well, is a really healthy business norm. I'm, I'm really hopeful for that. It's interesting for us at the ARA, um, we've been able to actually have joint staff meetings with the Rail Industry Association in the United Kingdom. And if you'd asked me 12 months ago would I ever thought that that was possible, no. It has been fantastic for our collaboration. So, yeah, I can definitely see some global opportunities for us. Um, John, I might throw to you. What are your reflections on, on where to from here? Well, I think the first thing, Caroline, is that uh, the transport sector in general, and I think, you know, the rail in particular, should hold their head up high in terms of how they've dealt with this, this uh, 2020 year with COVID-19 in terms of the resilience of the networks and the ability of the industry as a whole to work together uh, across all modes to keep the freight moving to supply, you know, um, all the supermarkets and keep goods flowing to people's homes, particularly when they've been locked up and, and restrained and how they can move around the countryside. So that, to me, is a very good sign for the future. Uh, as chair of the, uh, the freight panel that looks at the national freight and supply chain strategy, I feel you know, optimistic that uh, on the back of you know, a, being a, a big year for transport, that we can even make some further inroads into making sure that we, you know, use the, the mode that best suits the task and, in, and we invest in those modes, and particularly rail. We've seen some big investments occurring, you know, with inland rail, with the, the Port Botany duplication. We've seen New South Wales and Victoria investing in their regional freight rail networks, along with the private sector, such as, you know, Pacific National, SCT, Cube, investing in terminals around the countryside. So that's a very good sign. I think the... The trick now is to keep the momentum going, uh, learn from those experiences with COVID-19. And I think, you know, having an integrated transport sector that uses the best mode for a particular activity is going to be 
the, the jewel, I think, that we can uh, collectively achieve. So, you know, I think for, for too much of the past, we looked at modes in isolation. Mm. And I think when you, when you look at whether it's going to be sea, road or rail working collaboratively together to make sure we've got an integrated supply chain will mean that uh, each of those sectors will benefit and grow and share the appropriate proportion of the task. So I think uh, it's been a year of learning and, and experiences with COVID, but I think, uh, you know, both to stimulate the economy and to build a, a world-class supply chain, uh, I think we just got to go back and make sure we implement this strategy uh, in a timely, uh, in a timely way. Absolutely. I mean, freight uh, has never had such a high profile and we certainly need to maximise that. Um, Amy, throwing to you, obviously um, you're there in the operational sense. What are your thoughts about uh, what 2021 might bring? Um, I think, you know, John's right, there's a lot of learnings that we can take for forward into 2021. The one thing that I've noticed, not just in the rail environment, but in the general environment, is the discussion about data and people are more informed having conversations on the street about exponential growth and areas under the curve. I think people are much more savvy about data and information and being informed. It's a bit of a security blanket, so I think we need to take that forward. Um, but also the sustainable development goals, as you know, one of my favorite topics, but that is now at the forefront of a lot of discussions. And it has been mentioned obviously in the last three days, and it's in the value of rail report. And it's something which is becoming much more part of the general rhetoric I think we need to take that into 2021. But also, as you know, Becky mentioned, it's the community, the rail community, working together because we're all learning from each other everywhere around the world. Every operator around the world has had to adapt. Um, we've seen you know, the, the, uh, the sanitization products which are now out there either in Hong Kong or London and different solutions to the same problem. And we're all learning. Some people are leading in certain areas and we can learn from all of that. And I think we do need to collaborate, not just at the national level, but also at the international level with lessons learned across different operators. Mm. And Mike, obviously you've, you've had quite the helicopter view over your extensive career. Um, what are your thoughts on where to next? Um, look, I, I'd agree with uh, the comments that have been made. I think we, like most crises, COVID has accentuated a range of trends that were already underway and accelerated them in many cases. We've learned a lot about the importance of digital investment. Um, the reality is, um, whatever you think of NBN, um, had we not built the network or had a network, most of White Collar Australia would be on JobKeeper. Um, and the reality is that um, what, what it's really shown is that we've got to continue to invest in digital infrastructure. And rail is one of the key industries that is going to have to continue uh, to uh, put data at the centre of its operations and its digital infrastructure improvements. I think you only have to see the, the importance of creating safe systems for people to build, rebuild confidence to go back to work, uh, to go back into community activities and to utilise public transport is going to really depend on the quality of our digital investment. It's both uh, the quality of the ability to maintain hygiene, but also at the same time give people data and information about uh, future services, the quality of those services, how they operate, uh, and ensuring that people can feel safe and secure. The other thing I think has really been accentuated in, in this crisis has been the recognition of the importance of safety systems. The reality is that uh, we have been very fortunate in this country because we've had a well-respected uh, and well-resourced health system, and we've had governments right across the country that have maintained the trust and, and faith of the community. Um, but the only way you can do that is you've got to keep investing in the safety of your systems. And as John pointed out, there's been a lot of thinking about future supply chains. How do you ensure stability and flow of future supply chains in future crises? Have we got the thinking right about the length of our supply chains and, and how vulnerable they are at certain points? And, that, and the importance of those systems. Uh, and finally, I think the, the issue is really how, how does governments and industry in the future um, maintain confidence in the industry and in the infrastructure systems uh, and rebuilds uh, the, the future investment agenda around probably some different priorities than what we might have thought about even six to eight months ago. Mm -hmm. So it's accelerated some areas and it's really highlighted some other vulnerabilities for us. Mm. Absolutely. I might um, tease that one of the 
points you made about the rail freight sector with both you and John. Um, obviously, the profile of the rail freight sector has has risen this year, um, whether or not there's a, an increased knowledge that it's actually rail freight versus truck freight, but interesting to pursue. But I'd be interested in both of your thoughts of, you know, given what we've been through this year, do you think that changes our thinking about investment or where we're headed with the rail freight sector in light of COVID-19 and, and meeting the demand of the country in, you know, if God forbid in five years time we're at COVID-2, uh, how we, we sort of forward plan to, to put some further resilience in our rail freight sector. Um, John, I might throw to you to start us off. Well, I think I'll go back to the point I made a bit earlier. You know, it, you know, you know, through the experience of COVID, I mean, you, we we saw firsthand how freight moved seamlessly, really, by rail, particularly uh, between the states. It didn't, it, you know, the, the rail corridors are quite uh, quarantined, if you like, from the general community, and freight can move very easily uh, through those supply chains whenever there is an impact, like a, a pan, like in this case, a a pandemic. So to me, it just reinforced how important it is to preserve various modes of transport and to make sure that we're maximising their use in the areas that they're good at. And, you know, we all know that rail uh, is very good at high volume freight over the long distance, but it's also very good at high volume freight over short distance. And, you know, the Port Botton, the Port Botton the, uh, initiative to try and get improve the infrastructure and get more freight flowing uh, through that rail corridor as, uh, you know, multiple benefits when you look at, you know, big cities like Sydney, you've got less congestion, you've got safer roads, you've got, it's better for the environment and, and all the people you talk to out there in the community, you know, no one ever argues the case that they want to see more freight on road. What they want to see is that rail to be used to the maximum extent for roads to be used for what they're good at, and the same with, with our coastal shipping and so on. So I think, you know, we've got to begin to think not modal, we've got to think about multimodal and how we, we think about future movement of freight across the country, because uh, each mode depends on other modes to be successful as well. So I'm, I'm very much about, you know, making our supply chains efficient and looking at making sure we get the modes doing the doing the, the appropriate tasks to suit the the characteristics of uh, of each of them. So, and I think, as I said, COVID was clear demonstration that rail's got a huge role to play in moving large volume of freight over those big distances. That's why we need in, we need inland rail. We need better terminals. We need better connections to ports. Uh, the plans there, and I think we just it's only been reinforced after COVID, and we just need to get on with it. Absolutely. Mike, what are your views on, on moving forward for rail freight? Um, well, look, I'd agree with John that uh, the transport and logistics systems have been one of the great success stories, along with our health uh, and, and governance leadership, as, as to why we've handled COVID better than a lot of other countries. Um, but to do that in the future, we need to learn some lessons, one of which is we do need to look at the vulnerabilities. Um, quite early in the, in the COVID process, transport regulators across the country had to address vulnerabilities and regulatory restrictions. We need to look at those. Uh, we're going to have to go back and look at the vulnerabilities around things like our terminals, our logistics uh, planning, um, making sure that the, the rail system and the road system are efficient uh, through investment. And also, if you think about it, I think we need to go back and look at the energy picture as well, because had COVID been accompanied by disruption to our fuel supplies, for instance, um, we would have been in a very difficult situation given the, the, the way our supply chain is designed and laid out at the moment. Um, so, you know, we've got a plan for some of those future scenarios. I remember during my long time in government, every time we did uh, reviews of future risk, national security risks, we'd work our way through long, extensive lists. And when we got to pandemic, we'd all look at each other and say, yep, pandemic, that would be terrible, and we moved on. <laughs> we didn't pay enough attention to it in the transport and logistics sector, we now have. 
Uh, and we've got to learn the lessons out of this around how we do our future investment task, how we design our regulatory uh, systems to make sure that uh, we, we don't face impediments. And also, I think there will need to be a look, and it's already happening with some of the major retailers and logistics firms, how they've actually planned and designed their supply chain systems to overcome things that, such as were we to have an energy, energy uh, blockage. Uh, so I think those lessons um, are important. And similarly, as I said earlier, I think that this will be the catalyst for a big lift in digital investment. Uh, we've seen what we can do. We've all surprised ourselves how well we can operate in a, in a digital world. Um, we've now got to enhance some of that capability into our transport systems to give customers and users even better functionality. Mm, absolutely. Becky? I would wholeheartedly agree with what John and Mike are saying, I think, but, but there's, some, there's some great richness there in terms of, yes, let's work across jurisdictions. That's a real opportunity for us. We've seen things like National Cabinet. That's, that's great. I'm not going to open the box on things like, you know, whether we need to move away from COAG, but I do think there's an opportunity to get people around the table to say, well, what are the barriers? And let's resolve that. We've got some momentum. Let's keep it. I think also there's some strong points there to kind of draw in around the fantastic opportunities to learn across sectors in terms of even rail itself. So, you know, we're seeing some great autonomous outcomes for freight uh, and heavy haul. Let's bring that into the passenger space and really understand, you know, the safety aspects of what we need to conquer and to bring digital into our railway and really modernise the way we're using our passenger fleets. I think that's partly for me, actually driven by some of the observations from Amy on sustainable development. Mm -hmm. You know, real use of digital actually has has opportunities, I think, for us as an industry across the piece. It ticks a lot of boxes in terms of how we're thinking about energy and energy usage. It ticks a lot of boxes, actually, from a consumer perspective. You know, the value of rail reports got plenty in it about our green credentials from a freight perspective. Let's keep spruiking it. I think there's a real opportunity there. Mm. I think uh, for me, having participated in a lot of the discussions around uh, you know, we were almost, it felt like daily for one point, but, we, you know, Department of Infrastructure was pulling together really good, really useful engagement for us around impacts on the freight sector. And I think the one thing that I would want to see out of this is that before we move on to the next thing or, you know, before the department disbands all their COVID groups or whatever we get to <laughs> next year, that we actually take the time to pause and go, OK, well, what worked, what didn't? And I think certainly from a freight perspective, the joys of Federation and, um, you know, all of the challenges that that has thrown up this year has been very interesting. Um, I actually think the longer term, there might well be some changes for people about where they base people. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, I think we'll wait to see what flows through from some of those state border issues. Um, All right, could, could I just make a comment there, if I could? To, Absolutely, John. It gets, back, it gets back to the point that Mike made and Becky, that, you know, the one thing that I've learned, not just this year, but over the years, is that Australia continues to make billion-dollar decisions on road and rail infrastructure and at ports themselves. Yet the knowledge we have collectively in how freight moves around this country in terms of supply chains is really at a very shallow level. Mm. And, uh, and if you can just think through by building up that knowledge base, improving the data on how freight moves, those investment decisions are going to be made on far more solid ground. And I think that's you know, um, it always intrigues me when we ask, we, we discuss supply chains that very few people who make big decisions on investment on infrastructure understand how these supply chains work. And, mm -hmm. and the risk you run, of course, in that situation is that you make bad investments or you over-invest in one mode versus another. So I think the point being made throughout the session this, today that you get the collection of data on how freight moves around the, the countryside and what is the problem you're trying to solve and how much data you need to make those decisions is something that is still at a very early stage of evolution and it's got to be a priority for me. Mm. Absolutely. We might now transition um, for a little while from freight to passenger. Um, Becky, I'd be interested in your thoughts on what next in the passenger space? I mean, obviously, we've seen um, at its worst for some states, mm. levels drop 90%. Uh, obviously, there's been financial impact across the industry. Um, that throws up various different complexities. Uh, so we have the co operational complexities of businesses that are having to do things differently. 
we have an impact of a, a populace who, for whatever reason, have you know are either working from home, changing their habits, can't return to the office because of um, issues around capacity in their offices, etc. So. This is going to dominate quite a bit of the conversation, so everyone get pre prepared because I will be coming to you for your views on this. But, you know, what do we need to consider for 2021? Where are we at? And, and, and that's the complexity in terms of operational complexity versus also just the complexity of getting people to come back to rail. And I think, I think it's a really live debate, isn't it? I've certainly been absolutely impressed. And, you know, to, to, I think to John's point as he opened out, uh, and, and would like to express thanks to a lot of our frontline workers across the industry of how many people have just stepped up mm. and kept our networks moving, which has actually been outstanding. And this is a public health crisis. This isn't the sort of safety stresses and strains we are used to on our network. So that's been incredible. Obviously, I've got an MTR cleaning robot on my Santa's list as well, because they're very <laughs> cool. Um, but actually, to that point, for me, there's there's two real themes that come through. One of them is about building confidence and building trust, you know, and that does play back to data and how we communicate with our customer base to offer them assurance that we are doing all these things. It's nice, it's got an opportunity there where we can actually spotlight the great range of workforce that's involved in keeping a railway operational. Our cleaning staff, our frontline staff, all of those people, they are all central to that, to that communication of confidence that we have got this and we are managing this on our networks from a public health perspective. So there's a communications and a trust issue there. I think the other thing is we've really seen the kind of agility that a lot of our networks have demonstrated, you know, I think, and um, we've all picked up on that point. We've seen it from freight, we've seen it from passenger transport, that networks can respond, services can be flexed, and we can actually use some of that data and some of that digital knowledge to respond and change our service patterns where we need to. For me, we can't really predict by different centres and, and urban centres and regions how people are going to want to travel but we're going to need to be able to demonstrate we can continue to flex our services. Yeah. So we might not see the peak of the peak that we're used to. I'm very hopeful, as someone who's pretty passionate about the environment, to see our passenger patronage come up, as are many economic analysts. I think the reality is we are unlikely to see a change in the urbanisation trend, but I would expect we'll see some differences in travel patterns. And we've already seen in a number of our, you know, our states here at home in Australia that, that different aspects of the crisis occur. We've got a lockdown, you haven't got a lockdown, you've got people's responses. Having that confidence and then having the ability as networks to communicate that we will be flexible, that we will keep our services operational and we can respond to what passengers actually want in real time, I think that will be really powerful. So, Amy, you've lived this in terms of flexing and, and MTM. Um, your team, the whole team at MTM, have done an extraordinary job under very challenging circumstances this year. Um, what are your reflections in terms of operational opportunities and, and engaging the passenger into 2021? I think, first of all, yeah, the, the MTM, my MTM colleagues have done an outstanding job, both in the front line and also for those who have been working remotely. We had a bit of a reflection moment last week when um, Raymond, our CEO, he did a, um, it was a 2020 in review video for everyone. And it was, you know, he said, put out your words of what you think when you watch this video and pride and resilience were coming through. Mm -hmm. So I think that just shows what we can do as a team when we need to. Hopefully we won't need to do this again anytime soon, but it's just something to recognize that we can respond to changing environments, which change very, very rapidly. And I think that's something we need to take forward. As Becky said, we do need to respond to the passengers and what the demand's going to be. I think we need to, we can't ignore that people are going to be concerned about going on public transport. We do need to recognise that and adjust for that and to give that comfort, give that trust, and also listen to what their concerns are and provide solutions to that so that we are addressing those issues. Um, and the other thing is we've got uh, the main competitor we have really is the car. People are going to be wanting to travel in their personal transport to wherever they're going to go. So there's one issue with that is that we still have road capacity. We're still going to get congestion. So we do know that at some point that will tip people back into public transport and we need to be ready for that and we need to be addressing those concerns but also acknowledge that people are going to have also different working patterns. So we may not get the same people that were traveling before for the same amount of time, but then there will also be opportunities for others who previously weren't interested in public transport because it was too full or wasn't the right time, that they will then be joining. So we need to 
probably look at not attracting the same people back for the same amount of time, but who else can we attract to public transport and make sure that we are addressing the concerns of the general public for using a public space. Um, we see that in many other different forums and public transport is no different. If we want to be holding a number of strangers together in a confined space, we need to be considering the concerns associated with that and addressing them accordingly. Absolutely. Um, Mike, obviously, um, you know, one of the challenges with the changing in demographics and the decline in the numbers at the moment is the fact that as an industry we have a, around $155 billion worth of investment scheduled over the next 15 years. And I've noticed from some of the commentary in the United Kingdom, there's already a bit of a, uh, you know, industry putting the message out of, yes, numbers are a bit low right now, but let's keep up our investment. Um, I guess it's a two-pronged question for you. I mean, do you see this decline in passenger numbers as a risk to this investment for the future? And what would your observations be about, you know, as an industry, this, this growth that we're still planning over the next 15 years? Um, look, I think we've, we've got to continue to plan for the growth. Um, the reality is that what we've seen, particularly over the last uh, 15 years in Australia around public transport and heavy and light rail in particular, is that uh, they've been reshaping cities to be much more environmentally sustainable and also to create the sort of work environment for a services economy, which it needs. Uh, even if you projected the Australian population to grow much, much slower than what it has, uh, the reality is we have global cities that are going to need to continue to improve the efficiency of their public transport systems. So I think the investment will continue to be critical uh, because Amy's point is absolutely right. We, we can't have a situation where we're reliant on fixed road infrastructure to move the volumes of people we are. And also we're going to re need to rethink our investment pattern somewhat. We're already seeing the way changing work behaviour over the COVID period is seeing that the cross-city flows uh, and local transport flows have become much more important as work patterns have changed. So we're going to need to rethink some of that and some of the radial investment patterns that we've had in the past around our rail networks will need to be rethought. But just as importantly, we've got to, uh, coming back to the point of, that, that Amy made around future investment, we're going to need to look to a rail system that is going to need to match passenger needs. It's going to need to be more contactless, it's going to need to provide a safe environment that people are happy to operate within the public transport envelope. And it's going to need to use data to give them a much improved passenger experience, uh, which minimises their time of delays and waiting. And if you have a look at what the aviation industry is doing at the moment, uh, they are investing heavily in digital technology, despite the fact that aviation remains heavily impacted by COVID, um, on what they're calling contactless curb to, to gate systems. Uh, using digital technologies to effectively uh, facilitate people's uh, access through terminals. And really, from the moment that people wake up planning a trip, they've got digital data available to them about service frequency, the loads on those services, and the time involved on getting access to those services. What COVID has done is accentuate and accelerate, as I said earlier, our shift to digital services. The whole community has pretty much moved into a whole digital environment much more quickly than we imagined. And the rail industry is going to have to start making those digital investments faster than what we had thought. Um, and we're going to have to become much more passenger driven around our data systems. And you know, the work that a number of public transport operators around Australia have already been doing, I think, is, is leading the way. But as we saw from the, the, the video a little bit earlier, we're going to need to do more of that in both in, in hygiene and safe environments, but also passenger information which will give them a much, as I said, contactless. And as we're now seeing, virtually all of our building access is going contactless. Trains, planes, all of our systems are going to need to do more of that. Using digital recognition technology to basically enable people to, to move through systems uh, without having to take out cash or a card, uh, enabling people to get information on uh, passenger services that may not operate to the sort of fixed schedule we've had in the past which may more be geared towards uh, the sorts of demand patterns that move uh, as to what we've been used to in the past. So those sorts of things that digital technology will give us much more capacity to do that and schedule services quite differently to meet different demands of our communities. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, from a practical perspective, Amy, um, I'll start with you. I mean, what, what do you think this will mean uh, in terms of both, you know, carriage design, um, line design, operational design, um, it, it, to meet the needs of reassurance of the passenger, but also in a practical sense to factor in some of these changes we're making as a result of COVID? 
Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be some form of impact in the products that when the assets that we put out there. Um, you mentioned for train design, you know, we don't want to go back to where we had six people rooms on every carriage because we've come a long way from that and it provides a much safer and brighter environment within the carriage and it gives a high capacity. But at the same time, we then need to bring the benefits of those closed compartments to the current designs, whether that's looking at the air filtration systems, whether that's looking at having, you know, using data, as Mike said, to allow people to stand in the right area of the train, um, depending on density. I think there's going to be a huge amount of technology that we see come to market to address these issues. Mm. And that will be both for on the rolling stock and also at the stations. Um, there's some technology which is looking at how people are queuing while waiting for the trains, which is coming to market. There is technology about how to sanitize an individual as they get onto a train coming to market. There's a lot of innovation out there which will address each stage of the journey for the passengers. And we just need to be prepared for that technology to come to our networks. And we need to have the systems and processes set up to accept that technology and not wait for it to be um, 10 years in service before we can bring it to rail. And I think that's, we are gonna have to adapt how we work so that we can get more agile and get more tech savvy and get more futuristic as it were. Hmm. Um, so that we can address the concerns of the passengers. And I think that's something that the whole industry needs to work on um, together. Mm. Absolutely, and, and the ARA launched its uh, innovation and technology paper that was prepared by LEK, which did show that we weren't, um, weren't world leaders at the adoption of innovation. Um, so I guess that's a polite <laughs> way of putting it, Becky. Um, do you have any thoughts that you wanna share on, on that adoption of innovation and, and design and, and where we move to now with that, the passenger rail network? No, well, I think Amy's spot on, like ever. Um, but um, I, I was also, I guess, thinking a little bit outside just just the kind of rolling stock and the station assets and thinking about the fact that you know we saw some outstanding pictures obviously from from Osrael and the idea that we're going to need slightly different talent I think in our workforce as well so to embrace this new innovation to embrace this new technology and kind of bring it through the industry we probably need to have pretty open minds and be almost leaning out as industry to attract in the diversity of talent you need to start to respond to these, these newer types of product. I love the idea that came through the pitching competition of sort of gamifying a little bit with people in terms of how they're using their smart cards and how they're engaging to try and almost nudge them towards certain changes in their travel patterns, which mean that we can smooth out peaks and we can use our capacity slightly differently. Obviously, it's fantastic to see things like ETCS level two coming through where we can compress our headways and effectively create room for passengers by running our machines really efficiently. But then there's also the fact that we're gonna to need to invite these fantastic um, diverse thinkers into our industry to make sure that we can keep up. I think, it, again, it's an opportunity, but it's also something I think if we have front of mind that we need to be really reaching out and across and bringing in people from all sorts of professions and, and backgrounds to help us with it, it's a good way to start. Absolutely. Um, one um, of the- Sorry, can I just jump in on that one as well? Sure. Because I absolutely agree with Becky and I really did like um, the winning pitch on gamification <laughs> um, from Timothy Lang. It was, it was, yeah, really good, really good stuff there. Um, but. There's one key issue. If we look at bringing people in from other industries to look at this fantastic technology which is coming to market to uh, apply all these new systems and new processes such as gamification, we also need to look at our day-to-day -day practices. Um, you know, when we have companies which are still having to print to sign, you can't also be looking at using gamification and digitalization because the, the type of people that will be interested in those roles will not be patient enough to use old working systems and we really do need to look at not just what we do but also how we do that so that we can both attract and retain that new talent. Mm, absolutely. Um, one of the other topics that keeps coming up and in, in different news channels is around um, what COVID has meant for where people live uh, and a lot of discussion about oh well you know if you can work from home why do you need to be living in Western Sydney? You could be living in Nowra, you could be living in, in Bathurst. Um, I'm gonna to throw to John and uh, Mike on this one. Do you think that as a result of COVID that we are going to have any more speedier consideration of faster rail or high speed rail? 
John, I'm going to start with you. I know that's well, a controversial I one. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say, I wasn't going to use that word, but uh, look, I mean, I think people, uh, my view about it, and I think we've already seen what's happening is that people, uh, I tend to see to see, see the priority really is those people who live in regional areas want to live in those areas, but get into places of work, whether that be the adjacent or the nearest capital city is the priority for me. And, you know, in my experience, even at ARTC, I, I, we saw over the last probably four or five years the increased numbers of people who wanted to travel from the Southern Highlands, south of Sydney, into Sydney, and, of course, they, there's passenger trains that operate on the ARTC network, so... And they'd operate into Campbelltown and then you'd get onto the commuter trains. But so I can see that trend increasing. It's no different whether you live at Bendigo or Ballarat, and the, and the investment that the Victorian government have made on on the higher, faster trains down there. The announcement around Geelong and getting a speedier service from Geelong to Melbourne. I think they're the priority areas for uh, higher passenger speeds and shorter transit times. And if you combine that with what I think Amy touched on a bit earlier, getting the technology on board those trains that allow people to start work the, day, the time they get on them, uh, is where I, I think the, the focus is. I'm, I'm also of a mind that if you were going to have inner capital uh, very fast trains, that the Canberra to Sydney makes a, a logical uh, first step in that, in that regard. So it's more about, you know, people living in and wishing to live in those regional communities adjacent to those capital cities that want to get into those cities in a far more timely way where the priority is, and I think that's inevitable. I think we're beginning to see it, and it's only going to happen to a greater extent. Mm. Mike, I'm sure this has been an issue that has been quite the topic of conversations during your time at the department. Uh, what do you make of the impact of COVID and, and where we go to on faster rail and high-speed rail? Um, look, I, I, I'd agree with John. I think um, what it has shown is that even though we've demonstrated our ability to work in different places at different times and work quite differently, um, what, it, what coming out of COVID has also shown is human beings are most, most productive doing a mix of face-to-face uh, -face office, workplace, as well as home. Um, and I think the, the impetus will come to drive harder on faster rail. Uh, I'm not so sure about high-speed rail and... Uh, the work that's been done in the past has highlighted just how difficult high-speed rail is given the distances we have between our major capital cities. But faster rail between some of the regional locations and the capital cities and also faster rail to our mi middle and outer suburban areas is, become, is the critical issue. And, uh, and I think that, that irrespective of being able to work digitally, um, that, that will continue to be a major driver of future rail investment. Um, like John, I agree. Um, some of the links that, that we're already seeing, they're overloaded. Uh, New South Wales, the Wollongong Illawarra line, the heading, taking that further south, the Sydney Newcastle, the Sydney Canberras, the Sydney across the, the uh, Blue Mountains to, to some of those locations like Bathurst and Orange, and in Queensland, the regional cities, uh, linkages, and, and in Victoria and elsewhere. I think faster rail will be accelerated on the agenda as a result of COVID. It will be a key part of the future investment agenda, I think, uh, and it will be both outer metropolitan and regional cities connecting them quite differently. And it may not be the radial services we imagine now back into a CBD that we imagine today. I think what we're already starting to see and we're seeing globally is the emergence of these multiple city units um, where people are commuting cross-city into work locations quite differently to coming into a, into a CBD. COVID is the first major economic downturn uh, which has affected uh, a services economy, a digital economy. Uh, and that's, this is the first recession that a, a knowledge economy has had. Um, so it's, it will change patterns of work and, and the way we travel. But, and I think we'll increase the demand for faster rail throughout our urban areas and the close regional areas. Mm, absolutely. Um, we are very invested in the issue of faster rail and be issuing a paper later uh, in 2021. But I certainly think for, for the industry, that's sort of, you know, the big conversation we need to be having for, for the future. Um, one of the issues when we, we talk about back to normal, what really is going to be back to normal? Because, I mean, <laughs> back to normal 
even then we had some pretty serious issues about trying to grow the pie, getting more people on public transport. So, uh, Becky, I'll start with you. Um, you know, what does that look like? What are we going to accept as the, the new situation? I don't know if it's naughty to say. I'm not sure we'll be back to something. I think there's definitely a next normal beginning to emerge in mm. Australia and New Zealand, and I, I feel really lucky for that. I think that's a great credit to a lot of people being very smart about the, the way the crisis has been handled to date. I think my reflection would be, if, if we kind of pick up on a lot of the points that we've been making about the validity of the ongoing investment in rail from a freight and a passenger perspective and the ongoing growth in the industry, we probably need to just keep doubling down on the fact that we are going to need a lot of people in and around us across both sides of public and private sector to actually get some of this stuff done really well. And, you know, there's an opportunity here in terms of moving towards that next normal, I hope, where we can address some of the employment challenges that we've got. We've got an economic set of pressures that we're all very mindful of. And I'm mindful that the, the, the individual experience of 2020 will be very different across many people's lives. So we've still got a great big job to do. We need to be leaning back into that conversation in terms of how we're going to get the people in, get the workforce around it to keep going and keep that momentum and almost kind of bring a lot of the opportunities we've already discussed into that. Mm -hmm. So for me, the next normal is about taking a break over the festive season, mm -hmm. coming back with a lot of energy and just doubling down, keeping mm -hmm. going, keeping going and using some of that great resilience that we've seen across the industry and that responsiveness. Mm. Amy, I can see you nodding. Uh, do you have some thoughts to share on this, this topic? Yeah, I think, um, couldn't agree more, Becky. I don't think there is going to be um, back to normal. I think it's going to be the new normal or the next normal. Um, there's, for me, there's a reason why rail was um, a form of you know, transport of choice for a lot of people. And I think, as we mentioned, you know, urbanization isn't going to stop. There's a reason why that's been happening and why that's working in many ways. Obviously, at the moment, with the pandemic, not so much. But there, up until earlier this year, it was working. And the production may slow, but I don't think it's going to stop. So I think there's all the good things about rail and all the good things about how we were working before COVID, I think will still be there. It's just the the issues that we've found along the way, obviously with close working and close quarters, we need to address. And there'll be some adaption of people working from home. But as Mike said, it's not going to be fully, you know, five out of five days. It's going to be part-time in the office and part-time at home at a remote location. So there will still be a need to travel and there will still be a need for a service. So I think we need to focus on what we can do to support what is going to be a changed demographic, but I don't think it's going to be an, you know, the 9% that we've seen throughout this year. We just need to be able to adapt to what is going to be the next normal. Mm, absolutely. So one of the topics that uh, has been mentioned quite a bit today has been around innovation and technology. Um, Mike, I know you've spoken a bit about this. I mean, where do you think we need to be looking for that, that new dynamic in the innovation and technology space for the sector? Um, I think the, the passenger uh, safety systems and, and, and health systems are going to be quite important. And data, I think Becky's point around data is really important. Having the rail operators and the system operators having access to that data and then enabling that data to be provided to the customers and users of the system in a way that enables them to better shape their travel and also make them feel more safe and secure is going to be the key. And uh, some of the technology Amy mentioned will, will, will start to come through uh, into the investment picture. As well, I think um, the technology that is developing that where we can improve the safety of our systems, um, we, which is a big focus of the rail sector, I think we'll, we'll, we'll utilise that digital take-up. And finally, uh, we're going to need to rethink the design of a lot of our uh, platforms and our, our stations and all of our terminals because... Uh, the world is, is not going... Whatever we thought the world was pre-February, there is no return to it. Um, we are evolving into a new arrangement and, and, and the acceleration of some of these trends will continue, including the nature of the way the work, work shit goes forward. So I think that investment... And also, I think we do need to go back and have a look at where we have gaps in our national investment picture. We've talked about faster rail. I think that's, that's a really important investment agenda for the future. And removing some of the bottlenecks. You know, John's, John's uh, done a terrific job bringing inland rail to fruition, um, making that work, but also upgrading some of the other existing rail networks that enable our country to be more resilient 
uh, and to enable the redesign of our supply chains uh, to, to be even more efficient and effective, I think are the sort of key priorities for a, for a future agenda. Absolutely. And John, um, where do you think that translates from a freight perspective in terms of innovation and technology? I know there's quite a bit of discussion still in the industry around ATMS adoption, but what else do you need? Do you think we need to be looking at in that rail freight space? Well, I think, yeah, I, I agree. A lot, a lot of the comments I, I fully agree with. I think that you can look at the technology and, and of course, uh, ARTC has now commissioned ATMS on part of their corridor and they're looking at a broader rollout. That's a, a critical piece of what I call operational technology that will, that will be built on in terms of its, its, its uh, geographical deployment as well as its features. And I think that's a great initiative that has now started. I think from an innovation point of view, it's not just about technology, of course. I think innovation now is how we integrate our modes and, and rather than have, having those modes being uh, developed and, and invested uh, independently. And I think the real trick now is how not just... You know, we talk about people moving people around from regional areas or around capital cities. I think the, the focus in innovation for freight needs to be around the supply chain and how we integrate modes to make sure that we've got split velocity through the supply chain, we've got efficiency, we've got able to track the freight, we've got good connections between road, rail and sea and air. Uh, you know, growing a country, I think that's where the innovation needs to be. And I think, you know, I think we've got some really good examples of where that is being deployed now. We've got more bank. With the, uh, which was a government private sector initiative with Cube uh, now leading that charge. We've had you know, companies like SCT and Pacific National likewise building, building terminals to be you know, at the location where they can um, put rail next to the road, next to the, where, where the product is generated and able to move that around the supply chain. So innovation is not just technology, it's about how you work smarter and it's also about you know, innovative regulation uh, that, you know, government's responsible for and how you regulate these industries to ensure that they're not, they're not burdened. They promote, you know, uh, more efficiency, more productivity. So everyone's got a part to play, private sector, governments, on how we, we can uh, develop those future transport supply chains to be efficient, effective and meet the need of our customers. Absolutely. Um, conscious of time, I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to reflect on, on this year and, and, and think towards the future and, and you know, 2021 and beyond. Um, if you had a crystal ball or if you could do whatever you wanted, I mean, I suppose if I said, you know, what were the top three things you would love to see the rail sector adopt as a result of these changes or just more broadly, where would you get to? Uh, so, Amy, I know this is a big question, um, but I'll start with you because I always love how um, excited and inspiration you are about all the ideas for the sector. Um, I mean, what would you like to see happening as a result and, and moving into 2021? I, thanks, Karina. I do get very excited about the rail sector. Um, <laughs> if it ever occurs, I think it's a blessing now. But rail, you know, rail has a lot to give to the community and to the development going forward. You know, we're five years into the Sustainable Development Goals or Agenda 2030. We've got 10 years to go. There's so many questions that need answering and so many solutions that are needed, which rail can provide. And, you know, hats off to the ARA. I know there's a lot of work being done to lobby for rail and to provide those answers. Um, and I think now going into 2021, when one of our chief competitors, the aerospace industry is suffering a little bit, is a good opportunity to have that decision point of where do we invest in mm. rail or in air, um, but also to look at how we operate as a rail industry, to look at things such as circular economy, to look at new, new technology systems, the adoption of data, and not just data for data's sake, but actually data for information um, whether that's information for the passengers or operational efficiencies, you know, balancing the increased demand of freight and passengers. Um, and then also just to look at the needs for our passengers, I think just being working more with that, um, with the community to understand what the needs are 
and what the potential blockers are for people to use our systems, whether it's freight or passengers. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from 2020 and going into 2021, but also I think there's a lot that, you know, I've learned from being at home for the last nine months and starting a new role in the last nine months and not meeting my team face to face, but actually managing to get up to speed and to still deliver. Um, there's been a bit of a, a slowdown and not traveling across the country so much, which has, you know, there's a negative parts, but there's also the positives because my carbon footprint is a lot less this year. And that's something we should recognize. And what can we do with that going forward as an industry to, um, yeah, to look at how we work, to travel when necessary by air, travel by rail more, look at rail, look at rail as um, an energy user and how we manage that energy within the industry. There's, there's a number of points where we can hit on the sustainable development aspect as an industry, but also as how we work and how we function and then how we support the passengers as well. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, Caroline. Sorry. No, I think, it's, I think it's a great tangent. And I'm just sitting here thinking, yeah, I mean, when I think about how much I used to fly, yeah, footprints are certainly significantly less. And I guess that's the question for the future as to, well, what does that mean? And you know, I've already had discussions in our team about well, what meetings do you go to, what meetings do you not go to, what does that mean and how do you travel? So, yeah, I certainly think that's something big picture for all of us into 2021. Um, John, I'll pass to you. What, what do you think we should be focused on from 2021 and beyond? Obviously, data is front and centre, um, but what else should we be considering in the mix? Look, I just think it's, it's to continue the work that that's, has started, you know, with some of these big projects, and but making sure we take a supply chain view. I always take, I always think it's so important now that you know even the department in Canberra should be called the Department of uh, Tran uh, Transport, Infrastructure and Logistics, uh, because I think uh, getting the logistics understood and agree what we need to be achieving long term as part of our strategy then ultimately drives how we then invest in infrastructure and in transport systems. So, you know, I see, and I think that's a real opportunity for rail because I think it will only demonstrate how important rail will be the key elements of the supply chain in getting, reducing congestion on roads, making roads safer, being better for the environment. But you're best off arguing from a point of view of supply chain efficiency then, trying to, you know, just continue to, uh, announce the benefits of rail as a standalone mode. So, I think you know rail is in a good space. It's got you know, you know, customers, governments want to invest more in rail to get more freight moving by rail. But I think we're just got to try to, you know, discover the 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 purpose around what we want to try and achieve in those supply chains. So. Uh, that's key. I mean, along with that, we, I mean, technology, I mean, is a given anyway. I think whatever industry you're in now, you've just got to embrace technology and, 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 and grasp it when it comes along to work at how you should apply it to your particular area. But I just think that rail's got a huge opportunity, particularly on the east coast of Australia, that has been underdone in terms of freight rail for a long, long time. Uh, in getting the, uh, getting, looking at not just looking beyond inland rail, Looking at all those regional connections, the development of, you know, multimodal open access terminals in these capital cities, uh, is the is the real opportunity rail has got to play a far bigger role. Mm. Absolutely, uh, Mike, your perspective. Um, look, I think um, we should step back and look at what worked well and what didn't through COVID, and reflect on the last decade of rail investment and and systems. Um, the thing that has got Australia through to this point so much better in a lot of places um, really comes down to the quality of leadership and people. And I think the rail sector, as well as thinking about future investment and technology, all the things we've discussed today, if there's a couple of things I'd be highlighting is look at our people, look at our skill levels, look at who we're bringing through into the industry and start to set the industry up for the next generation. I think they're the crucial things that the rail industry leadership should be focusing on. We need to step back um, and say, look, ultimately, Australia has coped with COVID because of the skills of the people and the leadership and the way our community works together. Are we investing in the right skills for the next generation and bringing the right skill mix forward for the future? 
So I think it's all about people uh, at the end of the day and attracting the people who've got probably different skills to what we've had than those of us who've worked in the industry before. Mm. Uh, and that's not such a bad thing. They'll be different skills, but making sure they've got the right approaches to safety and systems thinking and bringing the best of technology and, importantly, understanding that this is a people business. And to be in a people business, you've got to have good people. Absolutely, and, and something for me to consider um, as previously CEO of the Airports Association. Uh, it's really interesting being here in the rail sector about, you know, obviously there are a lot of people in the aviation sector who are now without employment. How do we bring some of those people into the rail sector? And it's uh, unfortunately not as easy as it looks or you might think. So how do we as the ARA help to support that and the next generation for these, um, you know, decade-long investments? Um, Becky, your thoughts? I couldn't agree more with the, the comments that have been made and I absolutely love what Mike's saying about people. I think it really actually is about getting it right about people, about the diversity we need in our workforce in terms of thought, background, reflecting what community actually needs. You know, if we can get that right, we'll, we'll really be moving ourselves forward with pace. I think the only other thing I'd observe is we talk a lot about collaboration and we have seen some brilliant collaboration this year, particularly internationally across jurisdictions, but even just across different parts of our sectors within state. We've got to keep doing that, but I would even maybe harden it and say we also need to think about harmonising. We've really got to crack on with the agenda around harmonising our standards about being consistent. If we're going to move forward with pace on innovation, let's, let's get that done. And, and actually probably bringing those diverse thinkers in is going to help us do that. Mm. That kind of growth, growth mindset, that open-mindedness, it's, it's really going to help us move forward. Absolutely. So, conscious of time, uh, I'm now going to throw to each of you for either your final thought or top lesson from 2020. <laughs> Becky's laughing, so I'll give her a chance for a second. Um, Amy, final thought or best lesson from 2020? I think final thought, and this isn't just for 2020, this is something that's been in the forefront of my mind for a few years now, is that Rail is fantastic and we have a real opportunity here while we're at a decision point around the world for what is next, what is 2021, what is the next five years. We need to be there in people, in the forefront of people's minds to be that decision because we do have a lot to offer for the changing growth of the nations, for the changing work patterns and the changing focus on sustainable development. I think we really do need to be there and be that decision point. We do have things to work on. You know, we are archaic in some ways. I don't think anyone can deny that. And as you know, Becky was just saying, we need to have that growth mindset and we need to look to break down some of those barriers so that people don't go, rail is great, but we need to get rid of that but and focus on the fact that rail is great. Absolutely. Uh, John, final thought? or greatest lesson from 2020? Well, my greatest lesson from 2020 with Zoom meetings is to make sure you're well-dressed from the waist up. I think that's the most important <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, that I've learned. So it's been, it's been a good transition for me, COVID. That was the one positive that came out of it. So it got me used to uh, working with the Zoom meetings. But look, um, more seriously, I should add, I, I think from a rail perspective is that uh, is, and, I, and I really pick up on the point that Becky and, and Mike made about uh, the, the future and the, and the people you need to attract into the industry is that you've got to continue to fight hard to make sure that rail occupies its appropriate place in the, in the supply chain. And that's uh, never going to happen unless you've got, you know, senior people within the rail industry uh, fighting hard to demonstrate why continued investment in rail is so important for the country in terms of how we move our freight, particularly in those areas that rail is so good at. And I can't in the, underestimate how important that is to continue that influence, being influential at uh, a government level to make sure that rail continues and grows in importance in our supply chains. Absolutely. Mike? Um, key lesson out of 2020 is how quickly events can change everything you ever took for granted uh, and thought were locked in forever. Um, it's, it, the world can move quickly, as we've just discovered, and the real lesson is um, we've got to invest in people who can uh, bring a diversity of skills into the sector and who will drive change and 
build a better system should be our objective. Uh, you know, never waste a crisis is a is a often said thing. In this situation, we've learned a, we should step back, learn a lot, and actually bring in the dynamism we need to make rail continue to grow and develop. Uh, because you can't take what we've got now as ever being locked in. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly evolving. Becky, to bring us home. Ah. Oh. No pressure. I think um, for me, actually, on a personal level, it's really about using some of the tools that we've got better at. I suspect John's probably better than I am at Zoom. I don't, I don't love Teams yet. But using some of those tools to kind of take some of that pressure off. We've talked about our carbon footprint. We've talked about the fact we don't want to maybe fly around quite as much as we used to. Give yourself a bit of headspace. We've got plenty to do. Mm. Um, so using some of those tools that we're now a lot more familiar with and actually being a lot more considered about when we need to move around and when we can just reach out and connect with the connections we've now made uh, using technology, let's keep doing that. Because, uh, you know, we'll get a lot more done, we'll be even more productive and we'll also just give ourselves a little bit of space to recover. It's been a hard year. It has. I certainly uh, think everyone needs a very well-deserved break over the festive <laughs> season. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to my panel. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you for uh, being here for our final Upsticks part of Osrail. It's been much appreciated. I've actually taken lots of notes here for things that I want to follow up for, for the ARA into the new year. So I will be in touch with all of you for some of these great ideas. But thank you so much for participating in this panel. We really appreciate it. And I should probably just speak for the whole panel to say oh, well okay. done. Caroline, you've carried these days. Well done, ARA. You've done it virtually, and I think the industry really appreciates it. Thank you. Uh, the team has worked very hard. So, yes, thank you very much. <laughs>